Hi everybody, welcome to my new DVD in constant motion. What I'm gonna be covering in this package is gonna um, cover a wide range of aspects of drumming. Not just the physical and technical side, but also the creative side, and that's a, a really important thing to me. Uh, when, when talking with the wonderful guys at Hudson Music, uh, in what I wanted to achieve with this this new instructional DVD. It was important to me to really get inside the music and um, you know in, in the seven years since my last uh, instructional DVD that has been my focus uh, with Dream Theater and outside of Dream Theater as well. Um, to me it's not just about the drumming and uh, doing drum solos and, and breaking down the technique you know, there's so many great, great drummers out there that do that so well. I feel that my strength is more in how I apply myself within the context of the music, um, the creative process, in the studio, uh, live on stage, all of the dis different aspects that, that come into being, being uh, not just a drummer, but a musician and an artist. That's what I wanted to cover with this DVD. I wanted to give you, the viewer, the fellow drummer, musician, some insight as to how I kind of function. Uh, you will be able to get a lot of insight to the drumming. Absolutely, there's going to be an immense amount of footage of me live on stage, in the studio, breaking down parts, and it'll give you a chance to sit behind the kit with me, watch what, what, what I'm doing with my body, with my four limbs, you know, break down the parts. There will be a lot of that. But I also really wanted to cover a lot of other ground as well and give you some insight. So, even if you're not a drummer, even if you're a musician in general, a guitar player, bass player, keyboard player, I think there'll be something in this package that will appeal and apply to what you do.
In constant motion. For us drummers, it's a phrase that kind of sums up what we do. The nature of our instrument is a very physical one. Uh, in addition to being rhythmic and melodic, it's very physical. Um, other instruments, guitars, guitars, piano, bass, they're, your, your hands are kind of just stationary. Whereas for us drummers, we're in constant motion, you know, twisting from the left to the right, forward, in all different directions. And, uh, you know, although we're stationary and sitting, uh, which is my favorite part of drumming, uh, we are constantly moving, uh, more so probably than any instrument. And, and also, as opposed to guitar or bass or keyboards, uh, which are most of the time just utilizing their two hands, we as drummers are utilizing all four limbs, two hands, two legs, and our body is in constant motion. The phrase in constant motion definitely applies to me as well beyond the drums because I am absolutely a workaholic. And through my 20 years in dream theater, uh, my job has gone way beyond the drum set. Uh, in fact, you know, when I'm playing drums, it's just a, a small fraction of, of what I do in the band. I'm one of the co-songwriters and arrangers. I'm one of the lyricists in the band. I produce the CDs, I direct the DVDs, I design the merchandise, I design the artwork and the album layouts, uh, writing the set lists live, overseeing the websites and the fan clubs. It's just a constant 24-7 job and my wheels are always in motion. I'll lay in bed three in the morning just thinking of things and how to apply the different parts of what I do to the different aspects of, of the band and you know constantly trying to to give as much as possible to the fans. And those are just the areas that I cover within the context of Dream Theater. Over the past 10 years or so I've had uh, the um, opportunity to work with so many great musicians outside of Dream Theater doing many many different projects uh, in the studio and on the stage and we're going to look at a lot of that in this DVD uh, on the second disc. Uh, but I I have always felt the need to be constantly creative. Um, it's not a, a switch that you could just turn on and off at night or you know when the band comes off tour. For me, my wheels are in constant motion. I'm constantly thinking, I'm constantly creating, and uh, constantly driven. You know, it's a passion that's that's in you, and uh, you, you know you can't you can't formulate that. You either have it or you don't. And Fortunately or unfortunately for me, uh, I have it and, and my wheels are always in constant motion. In the seven years since my last Hudson DVD, uh, Dream Theater has recorded three studio albums. Um, coming off the success of uh, Scenes from Memory in 99, which was really a a great success for us creatively and also uh, commercially and as well as um, as far as being accepted by the fans. It was definitely a big comeback for us. Uh, so on the heels of that album and tour, we went into the studio in 2001 to make our follow-up, which to us was, um, it was a big challenge to follow up Scenes from Memory because that was a big, big album for us. We ended up um, going back to Bear Track Studios where we did Scenes from Memory and Images and Words and um, basically went in with the intention of just going for it. Whatever came out, came out. Uh, it wasn't going to be a concept album having done Scenes from Memory. And we holed up in uh, Bear Tracks for most of 2001 and wrote in the studio as we had done with Scenes from Memory and came up with a, a lot of creative ideas. It was a very ambitious, creative album. Um, uh, the songs were very, very long. We, you know, we took that even further uh, than we had already in the past, and we were already writing long songs, but this album just really took it to an extreme. In fact, the entire Six Degrees album was all about extremes. It was a double album. Uh, the entire second disc was one 40-minute song, and uh, the five songs on the first disc were uh, four out of five were over 10 minutes in length. Uh, the production, we got really experimental in terms of uh, the way things were recorded. And, you know, I was recording drums slowed down and sped up and uh, putting things through cool effects. It was a very, very experimental album. And uh, 
a lot of fun to make that record. And because it was so extreme, I think uh, it might have been a little difficult for some people to grasp. Uh, big songs and, you know, some different directions. But it's an album we're really proud of. And it was the first time that I recorded an album with the double kit concept. In fact, that album was recorded uh, with kind of a prototype kit. Tama just gave me a whole bunch of drums and I built a, a configuration, you know, with it in mind uh, for them to build me something to tour with. So I kind of recorded that album with some, uh, some kind of prototype drums that Tama gave me. And same with Sabian. Sabian sent me like, you know, a hundred symbols to choose from and I just kind of mixed and matched from song to song. So anyway, it was a great album and uh, it was a good time. Wish you were there. The Six Degrees album saw the birth of my double kit concept. Um, basically the idea was to have two kits in one uh, to, to supply me with different settings and setups uh, to be able to play on. And um, the original double kit uh, that I used on the Six Degrees album was the Siamese Monster. And uh, it's very similar to the kit I, I'm using now. The left side of the kit was very, very similar to this. The right side was very different. Uh, the right side originally was uh, very untraditional. It had um, a very, very small bass drum. It had some octavons over there. The toms were running backwards. It had a couple of different hi-hats. And uh, that, that side of the kit was really more experimental. But uh, one of the fun things I did on several songs uh, was to utilize both sides of the kit at the same time. And a perfect example of that is The Great Debate. And the song starts out with a, a, high, a double hi-hat pattern. And basically, I had a... Uh, uh, originally on that kit, I had access to the, the hi-hats the hi from the left side of the kit. I was able to access them with my right foot while on this side of the kit. And, uh, and the whole intro to that song and outro is a double hi-hat pattern. Uh, and I'm basically, I, I was playing my triple hat, which was located on the whole other side of the kit. So it was a cool visual thing as well to be playing um, a hi-hat that was going all the way over there while I was sitting here. Uh, for the purposes of this demonstration, we basically moved my kit around a little bit. Um, because this current kit, it, it's very hard for me to access my, ri my right hi-hat uh, from the left side of the kit. So we moved some things around for the purposes of, the, uh, purposes of this DVD. And it means I'm going to be twisting my leg into all kinds of strange and unnatural uh, positions. And I'll probably uh, end up with a, a massive cramp or a dislocation by the end of this video shoot. But uh, at least you guys will have a nice shot of the double hi-hat concept. So the whole intro and outro to The Great Debate is this very ambient, moody, dynamic, building thing that we wanted to create and have uh, samples flying by. And it's based around um, a, a seven pattern. So I'm utilizing the double hi-hats and uh, basically playing seven, four. I'm playing eighth notes, one and two and three and four and five and six and seven, one and two and three and four and five and six, seven. And uh, basically leading with my right hi-hat. And uh, so the, the right hi-hat is basically the pulse and the left hi-hat is on all the upbeats. So let me just show you the basic double hi-hat pattern uh, that, that forms kind of the, uh, the foundation of this. So once the double hi-hat foundation was established, uh, I wanted to try doing a bunch of different grooves that could build on top of it. And basically, um, the entire build is uh, four different patterns uh, that go with the double hi-hat. And then those build to an additional two patterns that are more of a, a, a beat or, or groove. So uh, let me start with the first great, deb great debate pattern, which is kind of a, a jungle beat but in seven, as this is all in seven, a jungle beat, but it's kind of uh, a, a sparse jungle beat. So here we go.
So once that sparse jungle beat was established, then the next step was to continue that jungle beat, but uh, kind of spruce it up and make it a little bit more busy. Uh, so it's a continuous flowing pattern. So here's the second pattern. Okay, so once that jungle groove was established, I wanted to take it up, up a notch and then start to work in some other parts of the kit. So the next level of, uh, of this build was a pattern using uh, the, a side stick on the, uh, like kind of rim shot on the snare. And uh, because my feet were being utilized on the hi-hats, there was no uh, way to have a, a bass drum, you know, anything to kind of accentuate the one, the downbeat. So what, what I did on the album is uh, actually my dad, who happened to be in the studio with me that day, Howard Portnoy, uh, he, he actually played the gong bass drum, overdubbed it on the ones to kind of uh, give you that pulse underneath this next pattern. Live, I'm, I'm going to play for you now the live version, the way I play it, which is basically playing the one on this um, floor tom over here. So here we go. This is the third level. Now to build this to another level, I wanted to start incorporating other drums and really make the pulse start to really build. And what I did was I incorporated the snare on the, s on the second kit into a groove uh, that was basically utilizing both snares. By the way, both snares are off uh, up until this point in the song. So uh, anyway, this is the, the next pattern, the fourth pattern. Uh, basically utilizing two snares and two floor toms and the double hi-hat. Now it's time to take it up a notch, and uh, at this point, uh, I turn on the snares, and live, I have to actually do it in one shot, which is, which is tough. Got to reach down and get it to play the fill to lead into the next section. But this next section is now, the, the double hi-hats are stopping. I got to swing my foot over onto the kick drum, turn on the snare, and then we start getting some seven grooves going, and the, the power chords come in on the guitar and we just take it up that next notch to really build the tension. So the groove I'm playing here is a basic kind of seven groove uh, between the, the ride and the hi-hat, kind of just establishing the feel for the first time in the song. So here we go. The final step and the climax of this intro is uh, a pattern that I'm playing on the Max Stacks. And uh, to really get, to get the whole pattern really building to a climax, uh, what I did was rather than playing in 7-4 as I had been playing up until this point, basically I took the 7-4, which is seven quarter notes, added the eighth notes, which basically gives you 14 quarter notes, and I split that in half and basically did two bars of 7-8 uh, on top of the one bar of 7-4. So I kind of just went twice the speed as the rest of the band. Still playing in 7, but it's a, a double time 7. So here's that pattern.
So that's how the intro to this song is played. And uh, one of the clever little things we did is that this intro, which is going like this and then builds to this climax, which, you know, basically is the body of the song. When we got to the end of the song, uh, we cleverly decided to now kind of run this entire pattern backwards. So it's almost like the song itself is a, a palindrome, uh, you know, a word that's spelt backwards, the same bo forwards and backwards like uh, auto or mom or race car. Uh, but anyway, this, this song kind of uh, is like a palindrome. You know, it's building, it's going this way, you have the whole body of the song, and then towards the end, it's the whole same sequence of events running in reverse until it fades away. So anyway, that was the idea uh, behind the intro and the outro of the song. The body of the song, you know, this is a, a big 13-minute piece, um, and uh, it goes through a lot of different time changes, a lot of different feels, a lot of different moods and dynamics. There's a lot of seven, a lot of six, five. Uh, you know, a typical dream theater progressive song with, uh, you know, lots of, it's a, it's a roller coaster ride, lots of different parts, and, and uh, it's always a challenge for me to play this one. So uh, I'm going to attempt it now. So here we go, The Great Debate. A Gallup snapshot poll taken immediately after President Bush's speech on funding embryonic stem cell research last night shows that half of Americans approve of his decision, 25% do not, and still another 25% aren't sure what to think. Most people don't even know what stem cells are. 
Thank you.
Six Degrees album begins with The Glass Prison. And uh, at the time of the release of this album, that was the heaviest, most brutal song we had ever written. It was just an onslaught from start to finish, a big 13-minute just pile driver. And uh, we've always had heavy sections in our songs up to the Six Degrees album, but The Glass Prison was a, a conscious attempt to write a heavy, brutal song from start to finish that was just relentless. And uh, there's a lot of really heavy, heavy drumming, a lot of double bass in this song, and uh, it, it's a real test of stamina for me to play this live. Uh, but I want to break down a few select parts of this song. Uh, it's a big, big song with a lot of parts. So I'm going to just grab a few parts to show you now, and then uh, you'll be able to see this song in its entirety uh, captured live. But for starters, let's start with uh, a couple of simple patterns. This first pattern I'm going to break down is a double bass pattern that uh, was kind of inspired by Vinnie Paul in Pantera. Uh, there's a song called uh, Becoming, I think. And uh, anyway, it kind of inspired this double bass pattern that I'm playing. And it's uh, towards the middle of the song, the second verse of the middle section of the song, if that makes any sense. But uh, basically, it's a, a pattern. And I always play single strokes with my feet, leading with the right foot. Um, but this was a kind of a, a tricky pattern, so I'll play it in the context of the song first, and then I'll play it again by myself, uh, and I'll slow it down a little bit so you can kind of hear what's happening. Okay, so now I'm going to play the, the pattern by itself without the, the music accompanying it, and I'll play it at normal speed, and then I'll, I'll slowly slow it down so you can kind of take a look at what's going on here. The next fill I want to break down for you is the fill that falls towards the end of the song. We do a whole long instrumental break, and then there's a fill that sets us up for the final verse of the song. And it's a, a crazy fill and uh, kind of a typical, uh, you know, pattern that I that I use a lot, and I've discussed them on other videos. Uh, but this is basically just a creative way of putting them together and coming up with a crazy transition uh, to, to lead to a next section. So uh, once again, I'm going to play it first in the context of the song with the music, and then I'll break play it by myself and break it down slowly. So here we go. So uh, the first pattern is uh, four sets of six on uh, four. It's four sets of a six pattern with four on top, two on the bass drum. However, the fourth uh, is only the four on top. So it's four on top, two in the bottom, four, two, four, two, and four. So let me play it for you at normal speed and then slow. It's then followed by uh, a triplet pattern, uh, basically um, sixes, once again, um, basically played six on the snare, six uh, on the, the, the max stacks with the kick drums, doubling it, and then another set on the snare. So, let me play it for you.
Then the fill is concluded with just a very simple uh, four beat eighth note pattern uh, just to set up the next feel. So out of all this crazy, the, this crazy fill and everything like that, it kind of changes from the quick triplets to kind of a straight eighth note feel to set up the, uh, the, the bit that's to follow. So basically it's just a, a four beat, bum, 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 bum. Well, five if you count the downbeat. <laughs> So now let me put the whole thing together. Um, I'll play it normal speed, and then I'll break it down slowly, and you can hear the whole thing put together. So there you have it, just a little taste of uh, what went into some of the drum parts for Glass Prison. Uh, another interesting thing about this song is that I had an idea lyrically um, to write about something that was going on in, in my life at the time and, and still to this day, uh, which is a, a big, big part of, of me and my life, my personal life, and uh, it's the, my recovery from uh, alcoholism and addiction, something that I struggled with uh, for many years and... and uh, and I've been sober now for many years as well. And uh, the lyrics I've been writing for this song and a few other songs are dealing with that struggle. Um, and The Glass Prison is the first three parts in a 12-part in a big epic that, that I've been writing about uh, based on the 12 steps. So The Glass Prison are really based on steps one, two, and three. And then uh, I had this, this grand idea of actually you know, writing this big 12-part song that would be spread across four, five, six different albums, and they all would interconnect someday down the road, and you know, like pieces of a, of a puzzle that will only be completed, you know, 10 years down the road over the course of several albums. And it's been a really cool thing, uh, lyrically, obviously, because it, it's tremendously therapeutic for me to, to deal with these things, and it's been a real positive thing in my life. And, the people around me, my family, my friends, and my band as well. Uh, but also on a creative level, uh, musically, it's been a lot of fun to to connect these songs. Uh, you know, where one ends, the next begins. You know, on a whole ne another album, and then you know they they kind of interlock with reoccurring themes and motifs. And uh, it's been a, it's been like writing a giant concept album over the course of several albums. Uh, in any case, so now you're going to see. Um, the Glass Prison in its entirety recorded live. And connecting to that, it kind of bridges us to uh, the next album in the Dream Theater catalog, which is 2003's Train of Thought. And uh, the connecting song is This Dying Soul, which basically is steps four and five of this ongoing um, saga that I've been writing. So uh, we're going to now spend 25 minutes with these two songs interconnected, basically parts one through five of this big giant piece of puzzle. And uh, I'll see you on the other side, and we'll talk more about this dying soul uh, after the performance. So enjoy. <laughs>
Wow. So uh, this dying soul is quite a workout, uh, especially when uh, played back to back with the glass prison, as you just saw. Um, the glass prison in itself is a 13 minute onslaught and then connect it to this dying soul, which is in like another 11 minutes and back to back. It's just 25 minutes. This ball of energy that just when we play him back to back live, I'm just want to collapse and die at the end of it but um it's a very very cool song lots of twists and turns uh heavy and aggressive as as everything on train of thought was and uh a lot of fun as i mentioned about um taking sections from the glass prison and interconnecting it and uh you know kind of uh making this big concept piece so there's a lot of things i i could talk about with this track um but uh, as a, the one part in particular that I want to lay out for you is uh, dealing with some, some cool odd time signatures that's going on uh, later in the song. Towards the middle of the song, there's uh, some verses going on with this really heavy riff. And the riff is a pattern of 4-4, four, 4-4, four, 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 and 6-4. And I'm playing just a straight upbeat, basically playing through the whole thing. So you can count it. You know, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm still playing an up, straight up beat through the whole thing, and it just flows. Um, so let me start off by playing you uh, that part and that riff, and you could see how it's counted. And then uh, I'm going to show you how I take it and twist it a little bit the next time around. But first, let's start with the, the straight four, 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 six part. So that's pretty straight ahead. That's just a straight ahead groove and, uh, you know, in, in four, 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 and six. But then uh, the next verse, we take a similar riff. The guitar and bass are doing almost the exact same riff, uh, slightly altered at the end. But uh, I'm changing up the feel completely. And this part is one of the more confusing parts I've ever come up with. In fact, live uh, to this day, it's still something I got to really concentrate on. And, and Jordan. Uh, our keyboard player is actually doing these accents with me. So usually live, I'm looking over to Jordan and we're kind of counting to each other to try to find the downbeat. Basically what's going on while these guys are still chugging away with the same riff from the previous verse, um, I'm playing patterns which are 4-4, four, 9-8, four, 4-4, four, four, and 11-8. And uh, the way I'm counting the 9-8 and the 11-8 is uh, rather than you know, counting one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. I'm just kind of counting uh, one, two, three, four, one, one, two, three, four, one, one. That's how I'm counting this nine, eight. So basically, it's kind of like a bar of four, four with an additional eighth note tagged on. Similarly, uh, the bar of 11, eight, I'm counting as a bar of five, four with an additional eighth note. So I'm counting that as one, two, three, four, five, one, one, two, three, four, five, one, one. So Put it all together, and this is the way you would count it. Uh, once again, it's 4 4 9 8, 4 4 11 8. So, this is the way I count it in my head when I'm playing 1 2 3 4, 1 2 3 4, 1 1 2 3 4, 1 2 3 4, 5 1 1. So, that's the way it's counted, uh, and that's the way I'm thinking about it and phrasing it. So, let me play that for you now with the music, and then I'll play it again. Uh, slowly so you can kind of feel the time signature.
Okay, so here's that phrasing, the odd phrasing, uh, without the band. I'll just play the drum part alone uh, at normal tempo for starters, and then, uh, then I'll slow it down. So here we go. See if you can count along. Get that? Okay, let me, let me play that now for you slowly uh, and see if you can count along. Two thousand three's Train of Thought. Uh, that was a, a fun album to make. It was definitely a, a conscious effort to make a, a heavy album from start to finish. Uh, on the Six Degrees tour that preceded it, we had covered uh, two classic metal albums in its entirety. We did Metallica's Master of Puppets album and Iron Maiden's Number of the Beast album. So the, the metal was flowing in our veins uh, when we entered the studio for Train of Thought. We wanted to make an album like those two albums where it was just every song was heavy and strong and you know uh, we, we always on tour we could feel the energy in the audience for certain songs and we wanted to make an album where every one of those songs was going to have that energy. Um, the recording of the album was different from what we had been doing because Scenes from a Memory and Six Degrees in both of those cases, we moved into the studio and wrote and recorded simultaneously uh, and also tracked song by song, which would mean in those cases we would write a song and then track it, concentrating on that song before moving on to the next. So my drum parts would be recorded over the course of four months, you know, spread, spread apart. Uh, for Train of Thought, because we wanted something that was just really felt live, uh, we decided to do it the old-fashioned way that we had done it with all of our other earlier albums, which was to basically write the material ahead of time in a rehearsal room with the amps on and just, you know, banging it out in a live situation, and then enter the recording studio. So we actually wrote the Train of Thought album in New York City in a rehearsal space over the course of three weeks or so. Um, and, uh, and then we moved into... Uh, we went out to Long Island and recorded in a few different cities on Long Island. And basically at that point, uh, because the album was written, I actually tracked all of my drums at the start of the session, which is something I hadn't done in years. And uh, basically, you know, over the course of 10 days or so, knocked out my drums and then the rest of the, the session, I, as the co-producer of all of our albums, I was there, you know, every step of the way in the producer's chair, overseeing every other aspect. But my drums for that album were, were over and done with pretty early, and then I moved on with the creative process. But it was a, a great album to make. Um, the fans, you know, if you weren't a metal fan, if you were more of a Dream Theater fan that was into traditional prog, uh, it might have scared some of you off, but it didn't have that balance that usually we try to have on our albums. But that was a conscious decision. We wanted to make a heavy album, and I think if you're if you like the heavier side of Dream Theater, we delivered the goods with that one, I think. Like most of the songs on the Train of Thought album, Honor Thy Father is a, a super heavy track. Aggressive, angry, dark, and uh, the drumming is just pure adrenaline from start to finish. Um, Lyrically, this is a song I wrote um, about a, a relationship in my life that had gone very, very sour. And it was an eight-year relationship of filled with anger and, and hate and resentment. And I kind of poured my soul out in these lyrics. Um, uh, usually when I write lyrics, they, they reflect the tone of the song. And this one was a very dark and heavy one, so these lyrics surely fit. And I'm happy to say that uh, since then, that relationship has been reconciled. So... Um, that's a very, very good thing in my life to have been lifted from me. But writing these lyrics surely also helped me kind of lift those feelings and get them out on paper and kind of spew them out. I guess uh, I've never been good at writing love songs, so I, I tend to 
go towards writing hate songs. <laughs> But uh, anyway, um, it's a very, very aggressive song built around um, a main riff that is a, a kind of an ostinato pattern. And this is something that we've always had in our career. Uh, probably the best example would be a, a song called The Mirror from our Awake album. And uh, it's a fascination I've always had with taking a pattern or a guitar riff, an ostinato kind of riff, and me turning the groove around and changing it up and giving it all different feels and twisting it into lots of different shapes and forms. And we did it in the mirror, we've done it in the glass prison, we've done it in so many of our songs, but this is a, another perfect example of basically this main riff is just going. If you take the first minute of this song and listen to the guitar and the bass, it's just one riff that's, that's the same thing over and over, but yet the drums are constantly shifting and changing and morphing underneath it to make it constantly exciting. The song starts off with a drum intro, uh, one of the few Dream Theater songs that actually does that, and I wanted to kind of have something that was just, just hit you right in the face right from the get-go, so I came up with a, one of my typical patterns uh, to kick into the groove and kind of you know, kick off this ostinato riff in a way that you don't even know where one is, and it's, it's very confuse, confusing for a while to find out where the pattern is. But let me break down this intro drum fill for you now. So basically the fill uh, is made up of two kind of different feels and two kind of parts. The first is a, a pattern that I mentioned earlier when talking about the glass prison. It's a pattern, a six pattern with four on top, two in the bottom. Uh, so the song starts out with five of those uh, going, uh, the first one is on the snare, second one is on the floor tom, third one is on the snare, fourth one is on the third rack, and then the fifth one is on the snare again. So let me demonstrate that for you. Let me slow that down now. The second phrase is something that's uh, kind of like a, a, a six pattern, I suppose, but it, the sticking is a little bit more uh, kind of syncopated, so it, it, it's kind of jarring to, to figure it, to feel the, the flow of it. It's basically a pattern that's going snare, tom, kick, kick, tom, snare, and then it repeats. Um, it's something that I picked up off of Mickey D when he used to play with King Diamond, and uh, it was a song called Welcome Home, and I kind of picked up this kind of fill from that, and I even used it in uh, Dream Theater's song Yitz Jam. So there's some trivia for you. Anyway, uh, here's that pattern. The fill ends with just a, a simple snare hit um, to set up the main riff. Uh, so actually when the band comes in, they're actually coming in on an upbeat. But when you listen to the riff at, on its own, it's actually a downbeat. It's a strange thing that we've, we've used that trick in several songs where uh, well, I'll enter or the band will enter on the upbeat of a, of a, of a part and it kind of create some confusion as to where the one is. So anyway, let me play the whole thing now, put together uh, at fast speed, and then I'll slow it down for you slowly. Now let me slow it down for you. So as I mentioned earlier, the main riff is based on this pattern that is a steady pattern that I'm shifting underneath. And uh, if I can somehow put it into words, what I do underneath, I'm going to try to give you an example of, of exactly what's going on. So basically you have, uh, the, the main riff is basically six kind of quarter notes and then a riff. So it's basically one, two, three, four, five, six, digga, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, digga, 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 that. So when the song starts off, you're kind of feeling the pulse like that. Uh, 
as if the tempo's like this. So all those accents I'm doing at the start of the song are giving that riff that feel. Let me play that for you. Let me play that for you now at a slower tempo. So from there, I kick into a groove that's completely the opposite of what you expect me to go into because uh, the riff is kind of setting up this jarring downbeat thing. Um, but I, at that point, I completely gr change the groove around to more of a kind of like a kind of strange triplet, you know, offbeat thing. And uh, the riff underneath is slightly changing. It's not doing the ticka ticka It's doing just to simplify the riff a little bit more within the groove. So let me play that groove that for you that I'm playing underneath that. So it's creating a bit of a, a polyrhythm between the drums and the rest of the band, kind of, uh, you know, basically I'm kind of doing a, a, a counterpoint to that main riff and playing that kind of strange triplet upbeat thing underneath it. And then at one point we kind of, you know, when we were writing this song, we did the math and we figured out where point A meets with point B. And, you know, so much of the writing we do is kind of like that. You know, it's it's like a mathematical equation. <laughs> and we, you know, figure out exactly where they meet and then, uh, you know, then we connect it there. So after I played that pattern, the next thing I wanted to do is take that rhythm and switch it around to like an upbeat thing. So the riff is going... So more of a, like a kind of rock and upbeat thing. So that's... You know, that was the next groove that I superimposed underneath this riff, so let me play that for you. Pretty simple, just your basic upbeat kind of rock groove. Um, but we're not done yet. <laughs> uh, I still had one more feel that I wanted to apply to this riff. So at this point, then we turned it into kind of a, kind of a sludgy halftime kind of mosh groove. Uh, so uh, basically, it's kind of just kind of constantly shifting and everything. So uh, at this point, it really kind of it opens up. You know, after all the jarring and the Twisting at this point is when you're finally, you know, you could really feel a, a groove out of that riff. So let me play that for you. This is just a basic, simple kind of halftime thing, but I'll show you how it goes. So there's a perfect example of how the drums can completely make the entire feel of the song. It dictates the entire feel of the song. Like I said before, if you were to listen to that guitar track, just concentrate only on the guitar, it's kind of a simple, boring thing that's going on and on and on and on and on. And the same thing could be said about uh, The Mirror, our song from Awake. Uh, and basically, it was just up to the drums, it was up to me to kind of give each of these sections life and uh, kind of keep it interesting. And every, every time I'm creating drum parts, I'm always trying to keep it uh, interesting, 
um, something that's you know makes you think, kind of gives you different perspectives and different twists on a riff. I'm always looking from different angles, and uh, in a lot of cases, I get to actually try all of those different angles within a song. Uh, that's something that I've always done. It's a thing I love to do with Dream Theater's music and anything I'm involved with.
step. Take. Mistakes like this. You 
Dream Theater's latest album, Octavarium, was a bit of a return to the more traditional balance um, in styles. Uh, we tried to do a, a variety of different things with the, the styles of these songs. You know, we still wanted to have some heavy songs as we had, you know, touched on with Train of Thought. But then we brought back uh, some of the more traditional prog elements in, in uh, songs like Sacrifice Sons and Octavarium. And, um, but also, uh, the big experiment for us with Octavarium was to try to write some short songs. Between Scenes and Six Degrees and Train of Thought, we kind of have, had done the long song format to death. Um, and uh, we love writing long songs, but we don't ever want to just, you know, rest on our laurels and just do the same thing over and over. So it was the, a challenge for us to try to write some shorter, more concise songs. Um, so the result of that experiment was songs like I Walk Beside You and The Answer Lies Within and These Walls. And uh, we tried to, you know, we've always had that kind of poppy side as well. You know, if you look at our older songs like uh, Another Day and uh, Lifting Shadows, you know, we've always had that side of us and we hadn't touched on it for a while. So it was time to, to bring those elements back. and. You know, we never want to make the same record twice, so it was, you know, time to do that. So that was, that was kind of what happened with Octavarium. Uh, as far as the recording sessions, we recorded, uh, we recorded this album at the Hit Factory Legendary Studio in New York City. And uh, actually, we are the last, uh, this is the last album to ever be recorded in that great studio. Actually, about halfway through the recording process, we found out that they were closing, and uh, we were the last band to record there. So as we left and took the equipment out, they locked the door for good. It was a, it was a sad session in that sense. But um, the writing of it was as we had done with Scenes in Six Degrees. We went back to uh, the, the, um, the, the way of writing in the studio and tracking song by song. And uh, the thing with Octavarium creatively, uh, you know, as one of the songwriters and lyricists and, you know, co-producer, for me, I, I had a big, big hand in overseeing the conceptual side. Uh, it was an idea I had of making our eighth studio album uh, be based on a musical octave, which is eight notes. So basically, we had this master plan concept and created a concept album in the, in the vein of like Dark Side of the Moon or Sgt. Pepper, something that's not like a story, like, uh, like Scenes from a Memory, but something that just has a concept running through the whole thing. And we spent a lot of time and, de and care looking over the details. Every song is in a, uh, an ascending key, going from F to G to A to B, all the way back up to F, which is the octave, thus the uh, title track, Octavarium. And uh, the artwork all ties in with that. That was something I had a lot of fun doing with Hugh Syme. And uh, it was a really creative album. There's a lot of depth to uh, the music, the lyrics, the artwork, the sound effects. Um, it was really a lot of fun to get into that and uh, gave us the opportunity to, to bring back some diversity to the band sound as well. Panic Attack is one of the most challenging songs for me from the Octavarium album. Um, it's a, a super fast, super heavy, super busy song. Uh, there's double bass going through most of the song, a lot of crazy patterns, and uh, even live, it, it's made that much more difficult for me live because I sing through almost the entire song. So for purposes of this DVD, I'm off the hook for at least half of my job. But uh, just the, the drums alone is a, is a major challenge in this song, and I want to just quickly show a few of the different patterns that are being used in the song. So the first verse of this song is in five, um, and uh, basically I play a few different grooves. Never, never um, satisfied to just play the same thing over and over. I, I kind of spice it up uh, and and have them kind of develop from section to section. So let me show you uh, how the five feel feels. It's basically one two three four five 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 one two three four five. The the snare is on the four of the five pattern, so that's the feel. Let me play it for you. Two, three.
So that's the first set of five in the first verse. And then from there, I develop it to the next stage of, of uh, building the tension. And uh, I kind of do, I open up the hi-hat a little bit more. And um, I, I hit the, the max stacks on the, the last upbeat, uh, kind of where the hi-hat was opening on the first half. So let me play that part for you. And I, I should mention, if you haven't noticed by now, the, the way that the riff is phrased, it's kind of three sets of five and then like a little tag in five with a riff. So uh, in all these cases, I'm playing the first three with a, a kind of a groove and then a fill on the, on the fourth to kind of accentuate the riff. The final part of this first verse is just continuing to develop the part and uh, keep that groove and feel, but just open it up and build the tension even more. So uh, basically, I'm totally open on the hi-hat at this point and uh, utilizing the, the, the crash in the china. So here's the, the last half of the first verse. Uh, the second verse to this song is in 6-8 time, and I'm doing kind of a, a cool little uh, syncopated double bass pattern utilizing um, my X-hat and uh, my max stack. So I just want to break that down for you really quick. Um, I'll play it normal speed and then uh, slow speed so you can kind of see what's going on. Uh, once again, it's 6-8 time, so it's kind of like a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, and the pulse is like this. So here we go. Now I'm going to play that groove for you slowly. Here we go. The middle section to this song um, incorporates steady double bass drumming and uh, some patterns that are really challenging um, to, to get down. And it's, it took me a while to even get them tight on stage. It's very difficult because it's constantly shifting between upbeats, downbeats, 16th note feels, triplet feels. Uh, so I'm going to run through it. It basically starts with... Um, uh, a pattern that's playing threes on top, um, in in a in a triplet kind of feel. Then it goes to a a triplet groove, then a sixteenth note groove, another triplet groove, and another sixteenth note groove. And the key to this for me is my feet are always doing the same thing. It never stops. I'm constantly just doing single stroke, uh, double bass patterns, sixteenth notes. 16th notes and 16th note triplets, um, just steadily, uh, always leading with the right. But it gets a little complicated with some of the patterns because uh, even though I'm constantly playing the same thing with my feet, my hands are kind of shifting feels constantly. So let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about so it makes some sense.
So it kind of sounds simple, kind of may even look simple, but it's very syncopated because the uh, the patterns of my hands and the patterns of my feet are doing two very, very different things. Even though they're playing the same note configuration, the sticking is completely opposite. Okay, so the, the next step is the, the start of the keyboard solo. And once again, the, the kick drums are still playing a steady uh, 16th note pattern. And having coming out of that little triplet syncopation, now the start of the keyboard solo is changing feels to an upbeat 16th note pattern. So my feet are still going right, left, right, left, right, left, as in one e and a two e and a three e and a. And what it is, it's actually in three, four times. So it's one e and a two e and a three e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a. And the snare is on all the upbeats. So let me show you that example. This is the keyboard solo part. A. So that's simple enough. That's basic double bass 101, just book attack. But now it gets tricky when it starts flipping back and forth between the 16th notes and the triplets uh, with the feet still steadily playing. So the second half of the keyboard solo is when it shifts to the triplet feel. So let me play that feel for you. So they're simple enough on their own, but now let me show you what happens when you put them together and, and alternate back and forth between the two. So this is the keyboard solo, part A in 16th note, and part B, which is more of a triplet feel. Let me play that same back and forth pattern at a little bit of a slower tempo so you can kind of uh, see it a little bit slower. And once again, when you're in the 16th note feels, you're in a three, four time. So I'll accent that over here so you can feel the three and then, uh, then it'll change to the triplets. So here we go a little slower. So that's the keyboard solo, basically going from the 16th note 3-4 pattern to the triplet feel, which is a, almost a 4-4-6-8. Four, four, you know, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. it feels like a 4 in triplets. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. That's the, the general feel back and forth between the two. Okay, now we move on to the guitar solo, which is basically the same two patterns, but I'm phrasing them slightly different in terms of the... Um, the instrumentation and the, the, the drums and the cymbals. So I'm basically playing the first half of the guitar solo um, on the hi-hat, which is that 16th note, 3-4 feel. And then I go over to the china with some tom accents uh, when I change the triplet feel. So let me play those back and forth for you now. So that was the guitar solo at normal speed. Let me play those two alternating patterns now at a much slower tempo for you.
the finale to this song is is just completely all out heavy and and crazy and uh, full of energy and adrenaline. Basically, this entire song has been pounding in that one riff. So when we get to the ending of this song, basically I'm just hammering it down and playing all downbeats, like a, a real kind of thrash, you know, approach to the riff. So uh, let me play it for you at its normal speed, and I'll, then I'll play it slowly so you can kind of see what's going on there because it's kind of a crazy chaotic part. So here we go at normal speed, then I'll pull it back. Okay, so at normal speed, that's just crazy. Let me tr slow it down for you and hopefully be able to play it slow. Sometimes these really fast parts are very difficult slow, um, but that's why it's important to practice with the metronome so you can get them good at all speeds. But anyway, let's, let's put me to the test right now and see if I could do it. Here we go, the ending of Panic Attack at a very slow tempo.
Finally, I get to sit behind the right side of my monster. Uh, I'm sorry I neglected you this long. I love playing this side of the kit. Uh, on the Octavarium album in the sessions, uh, using the, uh, the John Bonham kit and then on tour, utilizing this for the new songs as well as some old songs. It's, it's been a lot of fun for me playing this setup. And um, using this setup in the studio definitely directly inspired uh, not only the way I play, but even the composition to some of the songs when writing the Octavarium songs. I ended up bringing this setup into the studio thinking I might use it for one or two songs, maybe. I ended up using it on probably half, more than half of the Octavarium album. It was on uh, The Root of All Evil, I Walk Beside You, The Answer Lies Within, uh, Never Enough, first half of Sacrifice Sons. It was used a lot, and uh, it really inspired me to try a different approach to a lot of these songs. Uh, a song like I Walk Beside You is incredibly straight ahead um, as a result of the song, but also the kit. Uh, you know, I was doing more of a, like a Larry Mullen Jr. kind of approach. You know, he plays a small kit. Um, Root of All Evil, I was able to really kind of do, a, you know, like a Dave Grohl, Taylor Hawkins kind of thrashing away, you know. Um, the Answer Lies Within was more of a, a simple kind of cold play groove, uh, almost John Bonham-esque at times. So in all of these cases, I was able to kind of uh, transcend into, into a different kind of personality as a result of this kit. So the track I'm going to play now is the track Never Enough, and um, this song was definitely inspired by uh, my love, my newfound love, over the past couple of years for the band Muse. And uh, surely uh, a lot of my parts are very much inspired by Dominic Howard's playing and uh, the way I apply myself to this song and to the parts and, and the way the parts kind of inspired some of the song. So, you know, they kind of go back and forth. But in any case, uh, this song, Never Enough, is, is, you know, in that kind of real just open groove kind of um, feel. Uh, a lot of jungle grooves and hi-hat and a lot of big open crash grooves. And uh, I just want to break down uh, three different verse grooves that I play in this song. Uh, none of it is terribly difficult. Really, the, the key to a kit like this is simplicity, actually. Uh, you know, you, you can't get that fast or technical on a kit like this. It, it, it kind of defeats the purpose. So um, I want to just play, uh, I'll start with the, the groove that's in the first verse which is basically just a jungle groove, and I'll, I'll play it normal speed and then slow it down. This stuff is all in 4-4, four four, so it's just a, a steady 4-4 four four pulse. And uh, Okay, so here we go. Okay, let me break that down slowly, and uh, one of the things I should note is I'm playing most of the accents, uh, obviously on the snare, but at the end of every four phrases, uh, I'll play them either on the bell of the ride or on the splash, uh, just to spice it up a little bit. But in any case, here's that same groove now slowed down. I'm going to do it one more time still, even slower, so you can really see the sticking. Okay, now the second verse of the song, I'm actually playing three different patterns, um, shifting as, as the verse goes along in order to create some kind of developing um, orchestration within the drums. So the first part is almost kind of like a, a disco groove. I'm kind of doing a two-handed hi-hat thing. Uh, so let me start by showing that one. I'll do it at normal speed and then slow it down. So here we go. First, 
first half of the second verse. Now I'll play that same groove much slower. So here we go. Everybody put on your dancing shoes and away we go. Okay, the next stage of development is uh, kind of a more syncopated uh, pattern. Basically, when we're writing this song, I, you know, whenever we're writing a song, I'll try a bunch of different grooves and patterns, uh, and in some cases, I'll spread, I'll, I'll, I'll utilize them all and spread them over a course of one verse, two verse, three verse. But in this case, uh, really, I already had the first verse with the jungle groove. So with this verse, I, I really only had this time to come up with a groove, and I couldn't decide on the disco one or the syncopated one, so I ended up just tossing them both in there. So this is the next stage of development in the second verse, a more syncopated thing. I'll play it fast and then slow it down. Here's that same pattern, now slowed down. And then the third part to this verse is really uh, nothing that complicated, but for the sake of actually uh, completing the phrase, I'll play it for you right now. It's more of just an open groove and probably the most typical part that I should have come up with uh, for a song like this. Um, so it was the, the, really the natural groove that should have accompanied it, and I kind of just had to throw it in there as the final level of, of uh, building for the verse. So here we go. I'll play that one just, just for all you completists out there. Once again, at a slow tempo. 